Brettanomyces, aka Brett, often mistaken as a bacteria, it is in fact a species of yeast. It can be also called Decara, often found in skins, on the skins of fruit and natural airborne in most environments. Brettanomyces, as a yeast, is widely used only for beer such as lambics and spontaneous fermented beers. But nowadays, for winemaking, it is widely considered as a spoilage yeast, since it can produce off flavors in wine. But how to manage it? How to control it when it can be such a strong environment? With my returning guest, Clark Smith, author, winemaker and chemist, who has been studying and researching Brett for over 60 years, we discuss how Brett comes into play into winemaking, how to manage it, by non creating a sterile environment and everything in between from uh, and everything in between uh, how it changes from region to regions and and more Clark has recently launched a wine chemistry course called the fundamentals of wine chemistry links in the show notes if you enjoy the podcast remember to subscribe and to tell and to tell your friends but now on with the show Hi, I'm Mattias Carpazza, and this is the Looking Into Wine podcast. Wine and winemaking can be complex, but this podcast has a simple mission. We want to give you the skills and tools to harness your passion about wine. Through this series, we will shine a spotlight on some of the different regions, process, and concepts that shape the fascinating world of wine. I hope you enjoy the show and your own journey, Looking Into Wine. Welcome to the Looking Into Wine podcast. I am Matthias Carpazza Roast, and I can be I can't be more happy to welcome again to the show Clark Smith. And for those who doesn't know who Clark Smith is, one of the leading consultant winemakers and winemakers from California, and his area of expertise is chemistry and technologic. He has, previously, he has previously featured on the show and he's recent, recently launched a six-part uh, chemistry course on his website, which I'm sure we're going to talk about that. And But today we're here modernwinechemistry.com and today we are here to discuss a bit uh, one of the topics it covers on this course as well which is Brett and Amicis, aka Brett and for me it's all new but I'm very happy to to welcome to the show Clark Smith welcome well it's a great pleasure Matthew you're one of the best oh thank you Clark because we miss a lot um, so Clark I, I know that you Studied. You did your master thesis on uh, Brett, and yes. that was your starting point. That was in 1982, and um, how was it? Well, was... I wanted to find out how much SO2 it took to control Brettanomyces in the cellar to kill it. Uh, yeah. This was an outgrowth of some some simple work that I did. I was really shocked when I got to Davis that nobody knew how to use SO2. SO2 is effective against microbes in the molecular form. So we talk about free SO2, but the amount of molecular is quite variable, about tenfold over the pH range of wine. And it wasn't even till later that I found out SO2 isn't really effective in red wines at all because there is no real free SO2, just some equilibrium forms. Anyway, <laughs> um, I felt I, I found this out in freshman uh, enology class, and I said, nobody knows this. And so I, I wrote up, uh, I went to a guy named George Cook who was starting... Uh, a circular from the department called Enology Briefs, and I wrote the first and second uh, um, editions of that of that rag, and uh, and e even today you'll find the little charts that I that I calculated <laughs> with a pencil back then uh, yeah. pinned up on people's walls. So uh, so I extending that, I wanted to understand. In the particular case of Britannomyces, how much does it take to kill it? Now, yeah. there had been some previous work done in 1963 on cider in uh, Long Ashton in, in England. Uh, mm. They have a great research center there. They don't make any wine. Maybe they do now, but back then it was all cider. But that's where we got all the things that we... Uh, uh, the standards that UC Davis publishes about SO2. And 
and uh, they had Britannomyces at something like 0.6 to 0.8 milligrams per liter of, of, of free SO2, which meant at high SO2, you had to get, use a whole lot more free to get that much molecular. Mm. Uh, and they had a chart. So I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if that chart is right. <laughs> and uh, especially for uh, for California strains, which might not be the same as what they were using in England. And yeah, that turned out to be really true. It's unbelievable the variability. We'll get into that in a second. Yeah. But, so so Bretonomyces. Well, let's let's maybe start with the basics. Uh, Bretonomyces are a strain of uh, bac um, no bacteria. Yeast. Uh, yeast. yeast. Yes. They're a strain of yeast that you can find. A, there are yeast and you can find. It's a species. It's a species of yeast that you can find very various strains around the world and around the vineyard. Yes, or... and it's also the stuff that they use to make lambic beer. Mm -hmm. The species is Britannomyces lambicus. Don't okay. get me near a, a lambic <laughs> beer. I hate that stuff. But that's because I was smelling this this brett in the lab for three years and uh, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you did your share of that pungent uh, smell of uh, which well was, but it's but, not the same smell as you get in red wine uh the the compounds that cause the red wine aroma are uh well i'll give you a whole list of them but the the two ones that people use as an identifier not necessarily uh the whole smell uh, are are uh 4-ethyl phenol and 4-ethyl guaiacol. And those are derived from a couple of red wine, uh, ferulic and cumaric acid. You don't have those in white wine. You don't have them in beer. So the smell that you get from lambic beer is really just kind of bread, you know, like yeah. bread dough, uh, where you get this, this horse sweat and anomalia kind of character from red wine that uh, my lab didn't sm smell like that. Okay, and uh, so those are the aromas identifying of uh, bread, and you can get over a threshold, I guess, for a wine to be a fault. Ah, ah but you now see you're confusing a, 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 an identifier, a marker, with an actual cause. Okay. So, uh, yeah, there are listed thresholds, but I got to tell you, 4-ethylphenol just smells like a Band-Aid box or a elastoplast or... Uh, or shoe polish. It's it's not. It doesn't smell like a horse. Uh, and uh, foethyl guaiacol is kind of like salami. It's a smoked meat. Okay. It's not necessarily, you know, unpleasant. Mm. So uh, the compound that's in there that uh, there, well, there's there's several. It does make a little bit of volatile acidity, but uh, the the worst actor is probably. Uh, isovaleric acid, which is the smell of vomit. Um, and there's also, not in the smell, but in the finish, you get these four tetrahydropyrazines that are called mousiness. Okay, kind yeah. of the flavor of a, ma of a hamster cage. Uh, if yeah, you yeah. were to suck on your newspaper from your <laughs> hamster cage. I don't really recommend it. That's not the only organism that can make it. We get a lot of it in uh, lactobacillus operating on hot juice. So we see in the Central Valley when you have, you, you know, it's a, it's 105 degrees out there, you know, like 40 C, and the truck has to sit there in line with 100 other trucks for a day. Then you'll get that mousiness, and it shows up in large production rosés and that sort of thing where the Okay, but, so you have um, um, you have different uh, levels, I guess, for a wine to be over uh, bread or I well, mean the other thing. The other thing I want to stress right at yeah. the beginning here, because people just aren't aware of this, and this is the whole point of my book, Postmodern Winemaking, that wine compounds don't have thresholds in wine. That's because wine is not a chemical solution. It's a colloidal suspension. And the little beads of tannin and color that are in there intercalate these compounds mm -hmm. so that they don't smell as much. 
We see that when we microoxygenate. We start with a wine that has a lot of a lot of pyrazines. Mm -hmm. Those are uh, those are uh, like bell pepper and English pea and and chili pepper. And when we change the structure, we're not changing the composition at all. Then all of a sudden you can't smell those compounds anymore. It's it's not because we change the amount. It's because we change the structure. And that's a lot of what's operating when people talk about good Brett and bad Brett. What they're really talking about is good structure and bad structure. And the same thing applies to over-oaking or, uh, you know, as I said, pyrazines. So a lot of that defects that people point out in modern wine are not defects of uh, composition. They're defects of competence in building a wine that has a good integrative structure. Okay, so talking about uh, the endoring of Brett, where would you find Brett in uh, your cellar? What, what, what sort of environment does it thrive? In the wild, it lives in tree slimes and in honey. And one of its cute little strategies is that uh, honeybees produce an antibiotic called uh, uh, cyclohexamine. No, cyclohexamide. Uh, and it kills uh, Saccharomyces. Okay. So regular wine yeast can't grow very well in, in, in honey. And you learn this if you're trying to make mead. <laughs> uh, but uh, Britannomyces is, is immune. Mm. And so that's one of the ways it ekes out a living in the wild. And so like Martin Ray used to believe, and everybody thought he was nuts, that he had to pick all of his grapes between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. and get them all crushed before the bees came along. And and he was right. You know, bees are where Brett comes from. Okay, bee is one of the one of the culprit for Brett. Yeah, yeah, I because mean. they they hang around honey. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Uh, however. Uh, there's an, uh, another factor at play here is that the strain of Brett varies incredibly uh, throughout the world. And uh, in, in, in we don't have a way to show maps here, but I, I show several in my, in my book where they've located dozens of different strains of Brett. So, for example, mm -hmm. the Brett in Bordeaux doesn't even have the same number of chromosomes as the bread in Burgundy. Okay, and well. so mostly bread is not spread around by bees anymore. It's spread around by bulk uh, uh, trade. Mm. So if you buy some wine from another seller, I mean, I mean, pretty much we say that that there's two kinds of wine sellers. The ones where they know they have bread and the ones where they have bread but they don't know it. Okay, is that uh, is that popular? Okay, it's yeah, very. Yeah, and so we have a very uh, you know enthusiastic bulk wine trade in California. Uh, same thing in uh, most wine making areas where they're mm -hmm. they're trading wine. Some guy made a little too much, somebody else made a little too little, and they swap them. And when the wine comes in, it'll it'll have the the whole microbiome of the other seller which in most cases is a really good thing. We, mm -hmm. We'll get to microbiome in a, in a bit, but uh, that just means that what you identify as Britannomyces in, say, Sydney, Australia, will have nothing to do with what you'll find in Tasmania. Okay. And it lives in, uh, I was reading, I was trying to understand the concept. I was. I, I read about the wood as well and the barrels. No, Does that's it, pretty funny too. The, it, they lives in the, in the barrels. You know, Brett well. is very, very clever. In it, it has, oh, a dozen different strategies for being able to come in as a secondary infectant. And mm. you know, one of them is that uh, there's a couple of essential vitamins, biotin and folic acid, that it doesn't know how to make. So it can't grow at all until some other organism makes those and then uh, autolyzes and releases them into the solution. Then bread can grow. Before that, you get nothing. So one of these crazy strategies is that it can consume a sugar that's not found in nature called cellobios. Uh, and where, okay. where, it, where it is caused is by fire on wood. 
Okay. And so newly toasted barrels, new French oak is a really good source of sugar for bread. So you you would find the more uh, you could have more chances to have a quite a strong influence of Breton riches in the new barrels. Yeah. For new. Okay. And how do you control the? That's a question. How do you control the bread? Well, you, this is that's that that's a technical is, difficult. I problem. have a very <laughs> different opinion about this than most people. Uh, most okay. people think, well, you just have to keep your pHs reasonable and keep your SO two at around twenty or thirty parts per million and. Mm-hmm. And that's how you do it, and you keep a nice, clean cellar. And if you see any bread, then you sanitize, and maybe you burn the barrels, and and uh, oh, all kinds of draconian procedures like velcroin. You you can use velcroin to go in. It's kind of this magic fairy dust that you throw into the wine. It kills everything, and then commits suicide, like Rambo. <laughs> and, but the problem is that the best way to control bread is to have a healthy microbiome with hundreds of other species that will outcompete the bread. And, okay, and so, so like I, I did a panel once with uh, several sulfite-free winemakers and I mm-hmm. asked them, how do you control bread? And, and they looked at each other with puzzlement and said, well, I don't have any bread. Do you have any bread? No, I don't have any bread. And that's when I started to realize that that SO2 and sanitation and all the standard practices in cellars actually cause bread. It's a hospital disease. Okay. An opportunistic pathogen. So just like in hospitals where you sterilize everything and then you get these organisms that nobody ever heard of Mm -hmm. that are infecting people, that's, that's what bread is. Okay, so in a very clean environment, it gives a free way. It doesn't have to fight against it because it's eaten. Exactly. And, okay. and this is the same thing, you know, when I was going to college in 1980, everybody thought that the IPM guys were crazy. That's integrated pest management. The idea that you would, you would go ahead and let uh, beneficial organisms, you know, like ladybugs and praying mantises and stuff, just give them free reign of the vineyard and... Uh, People thought they were nuts, but we we had we had something called grape leaf skeletonizer that nobody had ever heard of. It was these bugs that would just come in, take over the whole vineyard, eat all the leaves, and then kill all the vines. Okay, and and nobody had ever heard of this. It was caused by pesticide because when you took out all the beneficials, then it was open season for these peculiar organisms. So. So that, that's called uh, Integrated Pest Management, or IB, uh, IPM, and now it's standard practice now. Yeah, exactly. I was saying, I was thinking, it's quite, it's quite common you have uh, your yeah. sort of sexual... So, so what, I'm, what I'm doing is what I call IBM, Integrated Brett Management. And, and, and part of the reason that this is gaining some credibility, back when I was doing my thesis, everything we knew about microbiology for a hundred and some odd years, came from auger plating. Yeah. Well, it turns out that most of the organisms that live in wine won't grow on auger plates. Okay. So when we came out, because of the pandemic, everybody knows what PCR is now. Yeah. Well, nobody had heard of it 10 years ago. But, uh, you know, it's basically forensic DNA as seen on TV, right? And... <laughs> Uh, I'm pretending I know exactly what you're talking about, but well, you, you know when they'll uh, the the expert witness will talk about the DNA evidence yeah. about whether or not this could have been you know this this guy's DNA. That's what we're talking about. Okay. And we've been able to locate at least ten times as many organisms as we knew grew in wine in any of the textbook. And so those are mostly beneficial. And a lot of what they do is chew up the groceries that otherwise Britannomyces would 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 uh, And then it would become the, the key strain of uh, Right. And it, then it, in that case it would become the major impact. Uh, well and here's flavor. the here's the piece of the puzzle. Uh, so Some you know I did could. I did my my first I got these fifty eight strains and I characterized them. And then I had three parts of the thesis and the second one was to determine how much so2 it took to create to produce a six log reduction in the platable numbers of bread 
Okay, so I'd cook up a nice healthy strain of brat and I'd put it on a shaker table and I come back in 24 hours and plate it out. And we have this technique where we can figure out how many organisms there are per milliliter. And my definition of, of, of cell death was a, a six log reduction, uh, a million fold reduction in uh, cell numbers in 24 hours. That seems pretty severe. Well, now that we have uh, PCR, uh, it's Charles Edwards up in, uh, in uh, Washington State figured this out. And he, he said, uh, no, I'm sorry, he's in OSU, Oregon State. And he figured out that what we were doing was rendering the Brett viable, non-culturable. Okay, meaning? So in other words, meaning that SO2 doesn't kill Brett, it just makes it invisible. Okay. And so, so it actually was able to thrive because we were killing it and everything else with SO2. The Brett would survive, everything else <coughs> would die, and then it was open season. What it did was it hide, it, it, it just hid out. He had, he had it in, the, in plain sight and it was, we couldn't see Exactly. It. Yeah, okay. that's, a, that's, that's the knowledge's best joke, and it means that, that all that work I did was complete waste of time. <laughs> and then is. the other thing that we did was figure out what the mechanism of cell death was, and I won't go into... The details on that, but that was very good work and and still valid today, and oh, uh, explains a lot about about how it works, which basically technical and secret. Uh, but but talking about uh, grape varieties, I've been wondering: is there certain grape varieties that are more susceptible to have a, yes a grow environment to yes to, for and, and bread? Uh, to begin with? I told you about reds and whites are different. Yeah. So in whites, Brett isn't as much of a defect. It may even be considered a positive, adding some complexity, a little bit like surly character or something. Okay. It doesn't smell like a horse. Okay. Uh, the compounds that, these two compounds that uh, we measure, Brett, are uh, ferulic acid gives us 4-ethylglycol and cumaric acid gives mm -hmm. us 4-ethylphenol. And those are very high in Pinot Noir and Cabernet Franc. Uh, the other problem that Pinot Noir has is that it doesn't have very much structure. And so it doesn't have much ability to integrate. But that varies. You know, clone 115 has a lot more structure than clone mm. 667, for example. And where you grow it, you, you know, uh, the, the Côte d'Or versus the Côte de Bone. Uh, you're going to have structured versus sort of ethereal. Uh, and, and, of course, Burgundy has a different strain that's a little bit more like truffles. Uh, the California strain, Ralph Kunke used to say, it smells like a wet dog in a telephone. <laughs> Very specific. But uh, yeah. there was well, a... nobody knows what a telephone booth is anymore. <laughs> but... <laughs> but, so for me, when I think of Brett, it makes me think of um, Southern Rhone. I don't know why, but there is this image sure. of uh, Southern well, Rhone and Boca Stella. Part of, that, some, some part of that is because Syrah smells a little like Brett. And, and so does Morvedra. Morvedra comes right out of the fermenter. You think it's bready. But it's really just the varietal uh, expression. But you're right. Uh, I I think Bocastel wouldn't be Bocastel. Uh, Lagardine wouldn't be Lagardine if it weren't for the Brett. And so, especially California winemakers that have been trained to know exactly what the smell is, and they become kind of allergic to it. And it means that they can't really do their job very well. They can't taste wine the way their customers do. They've trained themselves to have these super palates, and, and so any trace of Brett will make them crazy. And part of the reason for that is that they, uh, and we're going to lead up to an interesting paradox here. Part of the reason for that is that a guy named Ken Fugelsang, who was the, uh, the top wine guy at CSU Fresno, in the 80s managed to demonstrate that Brett would increase after bottling in the bear, in, 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 in the bottle. But Ken wasn't right about that. I mean, he was and he wasn't. Uh, I make a wine, a Napa Valley Cabernet called Crucible, and I only make four barrels of it. So 
I'm able, it costs a lot of money, but I'm able to track the 4-ethylphenol in the individual barrels. And first this one will go, and then that one will go, and then that one will go. And, uh, and I just wait for all the barrels to compete, complete before I blend them. And, uh, and, I, and that wine stays in barrel for five years. So there's plenty of time to do that as long as you have a, a warm cellar. Because one of the things I showed in my thesis is that Brett won't grow below 15C. So if you have a, if you're keeping your barrels at 13C, you're not going to get Brett until you bottle. In the store or in some guy's cellar. Okay, but, but that's not the end of the story. Uh, I, the, the reason Ken was seeing this is that he's in Fresno. So they were dealing with lots of barrels, like Fred Franzi would have 100,000 barrels. And, 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 and he wasn't holding them for five years, let me tell you. So he'd get Brett started, and then he'd blend everything together, and then bottle, and of course he'd get more bread in the, in the bottle. But, but I found that they always stopped at exactly the same point. So that wine controls how much happens. And you just have to have the patience, which nobody really does these days, to, to wait the wine out so that it, it comes to what we call microbial equilibrium. Okay. And um, <clears throat> I, was, I was thinking while you were explaining this, I had an interesting idea, which question, which is now... A, left me and it's, it's bugging me a bit but um so what is uh, for you the biggest like miss more um misunderstanding about brett if ah, you ah. if you were to great well i want to start by talking about a lunch that my friend rick jones and i had a few years ago and they had a bottle of 90 uh la gaffaliere uh saint Emilion on the on the wine list, and they were giving it away. It was like $70. So we so we ordered it, and and Rick tasted the wine and burst out laughing. And the reason was that it was magnificent, but it was magnificent, just as you would expect. It was just loaded with bread, but in a wonderful way. And he just thought it was hilarious that this wine would be almost a caricature of itself. Uh, all right, so now I had an experience. I guess I'm not supposed to name names here, but I had an experience with uh, in in December with a group of us winemakers from the 70s, uh, and one of them was his. He was making a Cabernet in uh, in Sonoma, and it was very famous wine and made in a Bordelais kind of restrained style. It wasn't one of the Cabernets like we make today that are all prune juice. Uh, very elegant, and they were known for that and balanced and so forth. And we all figured it would age a long time, even though it was delicate compared to, say, Kaimas. Uh, so we tasted the wine, and I said, the winemaker's there. And, and I said, geez, this is, uh, this is in amazingly good shape. It's still fruity, and it has its color, and everything's great. But listen, I was selling this wine in a store in Davis in 1980, and it tasted exactly the same. It hasn't aged, you know, a month since then. It's just, there was really no point in selling it. So then he pulls out this Magnum, and he said, well, this was from the first vintage we did. And the reason, see, the owner forced me to sterile filter every bottle of this wine that I ever made. But 
for the first vintage, me and my consultant got together and we want to bottle some magnums, you know, to commemorate the occasion. So they wouldn't fit on the line. So, so they couldn't sterile filter them. So, so the consultant says, hell, let's just siphon it out of the barrel. And he poured that wine. Oh, my God. It was magnificent. And so what that showed is you create the cor correct structure, like he always did, but then you have to let the microbiome paint the masterpiece. You can't do that by yourself. And it won't happen just by slow oxidation. It only happens due to microbiology. And so these, you know, paranoid schizophrenics that, that want to sterile filter everything or use Velcrin or, or, you know, just to kill everything in the wine, they're killing its greatness. Now they're doing that because they want to be in control and they don't want to get fired. And, uh, and if things go wrong in the bottle, you can get fired. So, uh, so that's the trade-off. You're making safe wine instead of great wine. And so what I do, that's one of the reasons that I hold the wine for so long, because I know what's going to happen to that wine when I bottle it, because it's already happened. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was always I was intrigued to speak to you, because I know this, the, the conversation is going to take, it's going to yeah. go somewhere very interesting. <laughs> and, and yeah, the deputy is going there, it's, it's gone there with the last uh, five minutes. It was well, very... of course, a lot of people have known this, uh, you know, Robert Mondavi started making Unfined Unfiltered in 19... 79, I think. Okay, wow. uh, the, the reserve caps were always unfined, unfiltered, and everybody thought he was nuts. <laughs> uh, uh, but I remember the question I wanted to ask before, before I forget again, uh, <laughs> which is, uh, it was about um, manolactic. Does that change? Because you said you, you go through uh, bread. Does it is it like in phases? Do you get first one and then you would get... Uh, yes. You would get... Mild there are two different kinds of bread. Uh, oxidative and fermentative. So one of the things you really got to do... Uh, this is my three-legged stool for, for, uh, for controlling bread. The, the first thing is to make a good structure. And that's all about not picking over ripe, I use microoxygenation to build a good colloid structure. Uh, then, then the second thing is to allow a natural microbiome to evolve. Uh, but actually, that's the third thing. The second thing is get a nutrient desert. So what I mean by that is don't use diammonium phosphate, you know, you want the yeast to, to go slowly and consume as much of the micronutrients as possible, including sugar. And if you leave behind over a gram per liter of sugar in a red wine, Acetobacter and Brett are going to give you nightmares. So how do you avoid that? Well, you need a, a vigorous yeast. This is one of the reasons that I don't really favor uninoculated fermentations. Uh, although they work very well for some people. Uh, but you, whatever you do, you got to figure out a way to get that sugar out of that wine. Uh, or you're going to get fermentative VA and fermentative uh, Britannomyces. Once you've done that, then the wine, and this is true for both organisms, the wine has to have a good oxygen appetite. It has to have integrity, which means you can't hang it till it's raisins because then it's already field oxidized and it won't take care of itself. And the reason you have to do that is, as I said, SO2 is not effective in red wine. It's bound to anthocyanins. Not a problem in white wine, but in red wine... It's bound to the anthocyanins, and they're not going to help you out. And what is going to help you out is two things. One is tannins that will gobble up the oxygen, 
and the other is that healthy microbiome that you fostered. So now the whole thing becomes, how do I get a healthy microbiome? And the answer is going to be different for every winery. It's something you spend your life trying to pull off. And sometimes you fail and you either need to figure out a way to change the conditions. Like one thing is you want, you, you don't want to be chilling the wine down, you know, taking the cellar down to 50 degrees and then taking it up to 70. And you, you, you've got to have kind of a stasis so the microbes can get in there. Uh, you're, by the way, once you get Brett, you're never going to get rid of it. UC Davis has got a tank that they've been trying to sterilize, and they're the most modern winery in the world. Three years, and they still can't get the bread out of it. So that stuff is persistent. But they can control it. They, you know, it's like it's like uh, athlete's foot. Do you know what that is? It's a fungus you get at the gym. You're not going to be able to sterilize your gym so there's no athlete's foot. You just have to get people to keep their feet dry. You have to, you have to control, you have to know and prevent and work in anticipation rather than Yeah, yeah, offense. and it's just, uh, it, it, the, 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 I'm going to tell you about Jim Law. Uh, he's the best winemaker in Virginia. He's just brilliant. And he came to a postmodern uh, symposium and he stood up and he said, well, you know, I didn't inoculate my wines for the first 10 years. I have these three vineyards that have completely different soils, and I really want to show those off. And I woke up one morning, I said, I hate my wine. They all taste the same. Uh, so he started using commercial yeasts. And now he's much happier because the expression of the vineyard is there. Now, that's the opposite of what Le Gaffier would call terroir because they want that kind of pumpkin smell that's distinctive, that, that's their house style, and they're only making one wine. So their idea of terroir is exactly the opposite of Jim's. Yeah, well, everybody has its, uh, his own, I guess everybody has his own ideas and ideology. And, and ain't it great? It, and, yeah, and, exactly. And, and I mean... Know, Clark, I, I enjoy really much speaking to you. I think it's so interesting getting to the head of a, a winemaker, which is very different to everyday person I meet and uh, get to speak about it, which is very, it makes it for me very interesting. It keeps me on my toes and trying to understand exactly what what are those chemical components and everything. And, uh, thank you. Uh, really enjoy. So I, I haven't quite finished answering yeah, yeah. your couple of your questions. Absolutely. Uh, one is uh, there are treatments. Uh huh. Um, I developed a treatment using reverse osmosis. It's not, you know, if you want to take VA or alcohol out using a tight RO, that works great. It's unbelievable, and we've put many wines in the. Spectators top 100 wines of the world list that comes out every year. Not so for Brett, uh, because the compounds you're trying to take out are much larger. So you have to use a looser membrane, and, and the wine's going to take a hit, particularly in Pinot Noir. Uh, and so you have to come back in with some remedial uh, mitigations. Uh, but it, but it does work. And this is to take out the smell. RO doesn't take out the organisms. They're, they stay upstream. So uh, if you want to knock down the organisms, there are uh, a series of products from different producers uh, that will kill Brett physically using a chitosan, usually derived from Aspergillus niger. Uh, and it's just, it just, it's little chunks of stuff that are about the size of a cell and they, and they break up the cells. And so I have been able to use that in some of my, some of my wines that tend to get out of hand, particularly around VA, but it's good for Brett too. But again, if you overdo it, then you're going to kill everything else too. And uh, so 
Certainly, if you sterile filter or you use Velcrin and kill everything, you've got to find a way to reintroduce a, a healthy microbiome into that into that wine before you bottle it. Uh, and uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, other organisms are commonly mistaken for mistaken for bread, uh, and in particular, Pediococcus which is a high pH form of, of uh, bacterium that kind of smells like dirty sweat socks, uh, is often confused. And, and, and you'll find the two together. So what we're calling Brett isn't always Brett. And the Brett from one place to another isn't the same. And the structure from one mind maker to another and their practices aren't the same. And, uh, you know, I personally kind of like a little bread. I, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it can add uh, some of the aromas and complexity into a one if it's managed properly. If it's and to me, that's respecting the microbiome. Don't sterile filter, but don't bottle too soon. Okay, that's last word of advice from Clark. <laughs> okay, Clark, thank you so much for this uh, this lovely chat. I, I feel like I came out more um, learned uh, and more sage about bread and uh, winemaking mentality as well, which is always good. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for this chat. But before I let you go, where uh, where could you people find the, the course again? Uh, oh, course. okay. I'll give you a bunch of things. Modernwinechemistry.com. That's where the course is. And it's basically an enology degree in 20 hours, including the postmodern part, which is everything that's wrong with it. Uh, and it's $4.95. Uh, if you just want to spend 10 bucks, I have a book called uh, uh, Pairing Wine and Music. It's, it's pairingwineandmusic.com is where it is. And, uh, and the name of the book is a, is a practical guide to pairing wine and music. It's very powerful. We should do, do a set on that sometime. Uh, and then, uh, then, of course, Postmodern Winemaking is available at Amazon for $34.95. Perfect. I mean, I, I met a few people recently who have hold the, the book. I really enjoyed it. So most of the, both of them were winemakers. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's yeah, the target. About half and half. You yeah. Know? We get, uh, you know, geeks like you will also appreciate it. Yeah, although you so. may not understand every word. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank you again for this time. And thank you. Thank you. You are listening to the Looking Into Wine podcast with my guest, Clark Smith. And uh, as always, remember to subscribe. You can find uh, Looking Into Wine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music. Amazon Music and every magic and listening app. If you're enjoying the podcast, you can donate on mattiascarpazza.com. Music produced by Samuele Di Nardo, editing and mastering by Tommaso Ascoli.